In this video, we will be exploring the male gaze, the oppositional gaze, and finally how Julie Dash's 1991 film Daughters of the Dust is an example of the oppositional gaze. So let's start with the groundwork by exploring what exactly the male gaze is. The film industry has been dominated largely by men and because of that, the visual representation of women has been hypersexualized and objectified. This is what is known as the male gaze. According to Janice Lorec, the male gaze invokes the sexual politics of the gaze and suggests a sexualized way of looking that empowers men and objectifies women. As men have been in power within the film industry, women have been framed only as men's sexual desires, which has been the dominant gaze. Feminist theorist Laura Mulvey, who first coined the term, explains that traditional Hollywood films respond to a deep-seated drive known as scopophilia, the sexual pleasures involved in looking. So most popular movies are filmed in ways that satisfy masculine scopophilia. Because films focus on a male perspective and the camera work very much places men in power and dictate what the audiences can and cannot see. Women are portrayed as nothing more than sex objects. This forces the audiences to adopt the male gaze whether they want to or not. Some examples of the male gaze can be seen in Michael Bay's Transformers with how the camera positions and pans over Megan Fox's character's body, as well as Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn in the first Suicide Squad film as she puts her shirt on while all the men stop what they're doing just to look and stare at her. However, because films are mostly framed from a white male perspective, this leads to some audience members either not identifying with the film's characters or simply flat out refusing as they are placed outside of the male gaze. This leads us to the concept of the oppositional gaze. So what is the oppositional gaze? According to Bell Hooks, the oppositional gaze is the rebellion and resistance to the dominant gaze. This means that black female spectators may choose not to identify with a film's subject, such as the film's female character because identifying with that character would be disenabling. For example, black female spectators would reject the character of Mammy from the film Gone with the Wind as it reinforces a horribly damaging and negative stereotype of black women. The Mammy stereotype enforces the servitude of black women in a white dominated society rooted in the slavery era of the South. The stereotype depicts black women as caregivers and maids to the oppressive white society. Hook states that the oppositional gaze was the response to the white supremacist looking relations, which led to the development of independent black cinema. In essence, representations like the Mammy stereotype are white representations of blackness. A quote from Bell Hooks says, we laughed at television shows like Our Gang and Amos and Andy at these white representations of blackness, but we also looked at them critically. Before racial integration, black viewers of movies and television experienced visual pleasure in a context where looking was also about contestation and confrontation. However, it is not only in the negative stereotypes from the lens of white filmmakers that the oppositional gaze can be seen in, but also in the continued objectification of women. The oppositional gaze is how black women spectators reject these visual representations. Up until this point, we have talked about work directed by white men. So now let's pivot and take a look at work done by a black woman director. Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust. Daughters of the Dust is set in 1902. The peasant family, part of the Gullah community, who are slave descendants that are isolated from the mainland of the United States, is preparing for a ceremony as some will migrate to the mainland. However, it is unknown who will join in the symbolic and literal crossing. Some members are coming back to the island sharing their experiences and newfound beliefs. The old traditions and the new American ideologies conflict with each other while doubts about Eula's baby arises as Eli, her husband, believes the actual father of the child is a white rapist. So how is Daughters of the Dust an example of the oppositional gaze? We look to the character of Nana, the oldest of the family and the closest to the old traditions, and is the culture's historian. 
Nana is seen carrying a tin can with her that holds the remnants of their ancestors. According to Dash, the themes of the past, old and crumbling, comes from a paper written by W.E.B. Du Bois, who says African Americans don't have a solid lineage that they can trace. All they have are scraps of memories. The whole film is about the scraps of memories that these women, these ancestral Harrises, carry around in tin cans and little private boxes. Nana is the lens of how the audience becomes aware of the resistance of the American ideology that many of the younger Gullahs are starting to adopt or have already adopted. Despite the belief that going to the mainland of the US and Canada is a good opportunity to find a new life, it is a form of subjugation. For example, Viola Peasant adopts American religious beliefs, becoming a devout Baptist and is seen praying in a church. Hagar, a person who has married into the family, does not value the African heritage and describes it as hoodoo and eagerly anticipates assimilation into America's middle class, seeing it as a new lease of life. We'll have gardens of fresh flowers, vegetables for the dinner table. Where we're heading, Nana, there'll be no need for an old woman's magic. For Yellow Mary, she looks forward to a new life in Nova Scotia, as she is viewed as ruined by the other Gullah members. By doing so, these characters have already been, or starting to, assimilate into the dominant gaze. Nana sees this as the death of the Gullah culture, as Viola and Hagar have chosen to almost forget their ancestors' past and instead focus on their potential futures. When I leave this place, I'm never again gonna live in your life. Usually, films exploring similar themes as Daughters of the Dust would show the audience the abuse and torture these characters would have to endure. However, Dash takes a completely different approach by never showing any of that. Their ancestors' past is shown in a different way than other films exploring slavery. Whenever their ancestors appear on screen, they are never shown with scars. Past matriarchs are seen cooking in a field and doing other chores as a little girl in a white dress runs across. This is a look into the past. The scene then transitions to all of the girls on the beach looking through a book at all the things they could have in their future as they go up north. Jennifer A. Makarlati states the use of crosscuts suggests connection across spatial and temporal dimensions. The natural sounds from the beach scene continue under the scene with Nana and Eli. Nana is the vocal link of connection. As she speaks about the ancestors, we cut back to the beach where the dance has become more intense. Carvel Wallace from The Guardian describes this as the film's conflict, saying, This debate on the nature of the past and the future, destiny and fate, is the film's chief conflict. Should we stay or should we go? To be black in America is to be forever caught between the sins and the promises of this nation. The peasants can only guess whether it is safer to remain in the home slavery has given them or risk ending up somewhere worse. This story takes place in 1902, well after the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing slaves and giving them rights. However, the ugly head of slavery and the scars of white dominance continue to show up in every aspect of life for the Gullah community. One such moment is the pregnancy of Eula, which is met with uncertainty. Eula had been on the mainland, and her husband Eli fears that this child may be a product of rape. Eula endured on the mainland, an evil and depraved action that continues to enforce the dominance of white hierarchy and white supremacy. As such, Eli wrestles with his fear and subsequently is unable to distinguish a symbol of love from a symbol of hate. Nana once again steps in and reminds him that the question is not his to answer. This then leads to Eula delivering an emotional monologue at the end of the film. She not only defends Yellow Mary being perceived as ruined because she was raped, but also speaks on black womanhood in the Gullah community. During this impactful moment, Dash and the director of photography Arthur Jaffa do not present any of these women as sexual objects. As Xavier James states, there is no overt sexualization of women that some may find in other films. They are complex, trying to come to terms with who they are. The dresses they wear also prevent them from being viewed as sexual objects. 
Instead, the dress speaks to their natural body and their political one. The dresses that the Gullah women wear allows them to speak about their history and their identity. Yula is allowed to speak her piece as the camera focuses on her entire body and actions as she picks up sand and does gestures to further establish her thoughts as she comforts the other women as they comfort her. The film does not close up on Eula's tears flowing from her eyes, nor on the reactions of men around her. Only the reactions of the other women are seen. The camera positions Eula and the rest of the Gullah women at the center of the narrative as they come to terms with who they are. Whether they stay or go, they must remember their past, but also embrace their future. Hook states the Daughters of the Dust does not simply offer diverse representations and imagines new transgressive possibilities for the formulation of identity. Daughters of the Dust not only critiques the male gaze, but also the white dominant society that has discriminated against the Gullahs. The film also gives power back to a black female director that touches on the sexualization of black women and how that has had damaging ramifications to not only the characters, but to the community. While cliche, we need more directors, writers, and photographers in the film industry to break this white dominant industry.